Um, hello, Professor Chomsky. And Hi. Thank, and thanks again for accepting to do this. Yeah. I want to start by uh, asking you about the current protest in the US uh, spreading like fire all around the, the country. Um, President Trump recently said, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. And then today he asked um, governors to dominate the activists. So when you see the level of violence um, that the police or slash military um, is inflicting on the protester, is it easy to understand following what the president is saying? Oh yeah, very easy to understand. He wants to ensure that the actions are as violent as possible. And he wants to call forth a strong military response. Uh, remember that Trump has, own, has an ideology, but it's very simple. It consists of two letters, me. That's the total ideology. And uh, he knows how to appeal to his white supremacist, racist base. And the way to do it is to stand up for law and order against these violent leftists who are destroying our society. And of course, there's a racist subtext that's pretty easy to detect. It's all traceable to those blacks. You know. So it's pretty easy to understand him. Incidentally, about that quote, he was quoting a Miami racist mayor from 1967. And there was a negative reaction to it. So he lied his way out of it. He said, well, he just meant that the looters would be shooting, which of course is. So, you know, when, when you have um, a lot of people say that the president of a country most of the time is just a puppet because corporations are actually giving the orders, etc. But when you have someone like Trump, who every day pushes the boundaries of what it is possible to say and do, um, like, do you think it spurs white supremacists and, and bigots um, into action, the fact that he pushes the sort of the Overton window all the time? Well, I wouldn't exactly say that corporations are giving him the orders because he knows the instructions without the orders. Uh, he's concerned with his own power and he understands he's a skilled politician. He's doing very well. He understands that his antics will be tolerated by the rich and the powerful and the corporate sector as long as he fulfills his main function, stuffing their dollars with, po with pockets with dollars. As long as he does that, they'll let him get away with whatever he wants. So it's, and in fact, if you look at his legislative program, that's 100% of it, uh, just enrich the rich and powerful. In fact, it's happening right now in a pretty dramatic way. Uh, the coronavirus is a respiratory lung disease. So what is he doing? Well, nobody's looking. He's uh, uh, removing the regulations which limit uh, air pollution, which increases the numbers of deaths by uh, the business press estimates maybe 10,000. Mostly black, so it doesn't matter because they're the ones who live near the polluting industry. Right in the middle of the pandemic. Yeah, if we can kill more people and increase profits for my prime constituency, perfect. Same with defunding the WHO, World Health Organization. I mean, this is an, it's his effort to try to, part of his effort to try to find some scapegoat for his responsibility for killing tens of thousands of Americans and the way he's handled this, so blame someone else. And it's easy to blame international institutions. His voting base dislikes them anyway. What's the consequence? Slaughtering unknown numbers of Africans and Yemenis who rely on the World Health Organization for medical services and supplies. But, you know, who cares? My electoral prospects are what matter. In fact, you can interpret the whole Trump presidency this way very simply. In talking about electoral, electoral, um, el like elections, uh, 
I mean, th there must be repercussions, repercussions, right? For for someone that um, is responsible in a way. So far, there's been one one, one uh, more than one hundred thousand deaths, and still counting in the U.S. The the, the elections are coming up uh, in a in a few months. Um, you've advocated to vote for Biden mainly to stop Trump. No, you haven't. Okay. There's a left perspective on yeah. this, which has apparently been long forgotten. You don't vote for people. You vote against people. Uh, every once, if you're a left activist, politics doesn't mean uh, coming, you know, concentrating laser-like on elections. Elections are an event. You know, they take place. They should take 15 minutes of your time away from real politics which is constant activism. And you take the 15 minutes, you decide, is there somebody so rotten we want to protect the world from him? If there is, you vote against him, which technically means voting for the opposition. You don't vote for the opposition, you're voting for the other guy in effect. Taking a vote away from the opposition is the same as giving a vote to the other guy. So you take 15 minutes, you decide, is it important to vote against this guy? In this case, obviously, there's a colossal difference between the candidates. So you take the 15 minutes and you go back to work. That's an election from the left point of view, not the establishment point of view. Establishment point of view is everything has to be focused on the election. You got to be laser-like focused on the quadrennial extravaganza than go home, but we, we don't accept that. Okay, and, and so talking about this election, what, what, what do you think? Is there a way for him to win? And, or could he lose? Is it even? Well, well, regrettably, he'll be using things like what's happening right now. And here we have to ask ourselves some serious questions if we care about the issues. Uh, it's very easy and right to sympathize with the protesters, especially blacks who are victims of 400 years of vicious repression. So yes, when they react, you've got to sympathize with them. You can also ask, is it wise? And that extends to the other protesters. It, maybe what you're doing is understandable, but is it wise? Here you have to ask yourself a question that should be foremost in the mind for any activist. There's a difference between feel-good politics and do-good politics. So you have to ask yourself, is this just something that makes me feel good? If so, it's just self-indulgence, forget it. Is it something that's going to advance the cause I'm interested in? Well, then you get serious questions. And on this, we have a ton of evidence. The overwhelming evidence is that violent protests are a gift to the right. Constantly, they reinforce the Trump types. It's a gift to them. They love it. Uh, Nonviolent protests are much harder, take a lot more courage, uh, but they succeed. They do have a steady effect of increasing support for the cause you're pursuing. But the evidence on this is pretty strong. It's difficult. It's, you know, you can understand people are so angry that they'll you know, smash a store window or something. It's understandable. It's not wise unless you're working for the opposition. And in fact, a lot of the protesters probably are. But what we call the protests are pretty much a mixture. Among them are white supremacists who want to instigate a race war and set up a you know, white Christian uh, dystopia. They're probably prop provocateurs. I wouldn't be surprised they usually are. And a lot of genuine activists on the left who are outraged with happen what's happening, but are not thinking it through. This has happened over and over again always with the same consequences, not just on this issue. But we should also look at something else. The amazing hypocrisy of the law and order types. Right at the time 
where they're saying, let's bring in the troops to you know, kill the demonstrators. They're giving immense gifts to people who are violating the law. Like, and this includes the liberals, like the liberal governor of New York, Cuomo, just uh, passed a, a legislation to grant immunity to the corporate owners of the nursing homes who bought them up to try to milk every cent of profit from them and meanwhile are consigning uh, the people there to the death from coronavirus. So they should have immunity. Uh, the Trump Republicans are trying to pass legislation right now, which will give immunity to the corporations who are ordering their workers back to work, uh, even in the face of serious death threats. So let's give immunity to them. Uh, white collar prosecutions have dropped to the lowest point ever. Uh, environmental uh, prosec prosecutions for environmental violations are disappearing. So the idea of law and order is, yeah, let's go after the, guy, the, the guys who are protesting racism, but meanwhile, let's lavish gifts on the, uh, the uh, criminals who are ro killing people at random, uh, robbing the population of huge amounts. I mean, some of this is so obscene, you don't know what to say about it. It was going under, under Obama too. One of the major white collar crimes in the United States is wage theft. Uh, employers who simply refuse to pay wages that are due, usually from poor people, you know, blacks can't, they're not gonna start a lawsuit, they can't do anything about it. This is estimated at billions of dollars a year of robbery of poor working people. The right is not only is working hard to impose restrictions against even investigating it, let alone criminalizing it, because that's the kind of crime that's good. That's the kind of crime we want to extend. And if you look at it more broadly, it amounts of tens of trillions of dollars a year. Uh, tax havens and stock buybacks are just pure robbery of the public. Before Reagan, they were illegal in the United States. And in fact, it was enforced, the Justice Department actually enforced it. Reagan opened the spigot. Uh, it, it really blossomed under Clinton. That's when it really took off. Now, this is bipartisan robbery of the poor and vulnerable. It goes on all the time huge amounts of money. I mean, utterly dwarfs anything that people are talking about in law and order, but it's under the radar because it's protecting the rich and the powerful. So therefore, I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to see it. Uh, and in fact, you see no, no comment, or no you know, occasional comments on it at the fringe. Uh, people like us may talk about it, but it's not going to reach anywhere. That's okay. law and order. I wanted to ask you about um, something, uh, something else regarding the, the, the current Corona crisis. The, um, you've wrote, you've, written, you've co-written a book um, called Manufacturing Consent uh, a while ago. Um, can you tell us about the role played by the corporate media into, in a way, pacifying the people? We've seen something incredible happen in the last two months. People were just asked through bombardment by the media to stay home, not to go and see the elders dying in, in care homes. And most people listened very quickly. Well, in this case, I, I see the problem elsewhere. But with regard to listening, I think that makes sense. Uh, go, violating the lockdown orders is comparable to running around in the streets with an assault rifle firing randomly. Now, you're endangering people. Uh, I don't think people should be encouraged to endanger others seriously. So keeping to the lockdown orders, I mean, there may be exceptions, but by and large, it's pretty reasonable. The manufacturer of consent comes somewhere else. It's from where it usually comes from, silence. 
what is not being talked about. So for example, why is there a coronavirus pandemic? We better answer that question just for our own safety, because there's another one coming, which will be worse because of global warming. And if we don't ask ourselves why this one came and prepare for the next one, we'll be in deep trouble. So that's a question that should be very high in priority. You can look and see how much it's discussed. And there's a reason why it's not discussed. That's a capitalist crime, not the kind of thing you discuss. So it was, it's, not, it's transparent, just open your eyes. 2003, after the SARS epidemic was contained, the scientists were talking quite openly about the next likely epidemic, probably a coronavirus, and what we could do to prepare for it. But it's not enough to have the knowledge. Somebody has to do something with it. Well, who would it be? I mean, the drug companies have you know, money pouring out of their ears. They have all the resources, but they're blocked by something called capitalism. It's not profitable to prepare for a coming catastrophe. It's profitable to do what you can make money on tomorrow. So they're blocked. Well, the government could step in. They have plenty of resources. They do mo most of the work on viruses and vaccines anyway. They hand it over to private corporations for marketing and profit. So they could do the whole job. They're blocked by something called Reagan and Thatcher, uh, neoliberalism. The government is the problem, not the solution. You translate that into English, it means take decisions away from the government, which has a flaw it's partially responsible to the public. Put it in the hands of private tyrannies who are totally unaccountable to the public. Now, that's what it means to say government is the problem, there's no society. And we've been living with that for 40 years with consequences we don't have to review. Uh, right now, what it means is the government can't step in to fulfill what the private corporations don't want to do because it's not profitable. So it's a capitalist crisis exacerbated by neoliberalism, exacerbated further by malignancies like President Trump, extreme end. I mean, countries did respond in one or another way to the crisis. The US just didn't respond. I mean, it was even US intelligence services were banging at the door of the White House for two months trying to get somebody to pay attention. You know, he's just busy looking at his TV ratings. When the stock market went down, he finally noticed. And since then, there's just been efforts to cover up and chaos. I mean, the, some of the things that have been done are just almost surreal. Like uh, everyone's concerned, of course, with getting a vaccine. There is a scientist in the government in charge of vaccine production. He was fired by the president. Why? because he questioned some of his quack remedies. Uh, Trump has managed to surround himself with pure psychophants, like Mike Pompeo, who knows only one thing, how to lick his boots. Everyone else has been kicked out. Now, just in the last couple of weeks, he carried out a purge, an amazing purge of the inspector generals. Now, these are people who we are imposed mostly by Republicans, incidentally, to oversee the departments in the government to weed out corruption, to stop illegal activities. Trump has created a total swamp of corruption. He has just fired all the inspector generals. Now that's a coup reminiscent of a fascist state. I mean, it gets a couple of words of not nice, but uh, those are the kind of things he's been doing. It's a power takeover in the interests of corporate power, the rich, the profitable, they're making out like bandits, right through the coronavirus epidemic, the private equity funds, the hedge funds, the major corporations are seeing profits go through the sky, just as in the 2008 recession, we're seeing it again. Uh, there's a stimulus program, a huge stimulus program. Who administers it? 
banks, how are they going to administer it? Okay. I don't have to talk about it. Of course, they're supervised by Steve Mnuchin, uh, Trump's right hand man, so we're in good hands. Maybe Jared Kushner's helping. So you can figure out what's going to happen, and as the facts dribble in, that's what's happening. I mean, it's a the corruption, the uh, uh, the sadism of it is really hard to describe. So yes, that's what the pandemic was caused by: capitalist crisis, neoliberal crisis on top of it, gangsters from the top capitalist class exacerbating. I don't see much about that in the New York Times. Thank you, Professor Chomsky. Thanks, uh, thanks again for your time. Good to talk to you. <laughs> thanks. Have a lovely day. Sorry, I gotta rush off to the next round. No, no. Good luck. Good luck with everything. Bye bye.